coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We're going to talk about 11 things that you can do with your pears and apples. As well as five vegetables that you can grow indoors over the winter that is really easy to grow. And we're going to speak with Gary Oppenheimer from AmpleHarvest.org. As well as your garden questions and our garden answers. Garden Radio's in the air and it all starts right now. You are tuned in to the only vegetable gardening radio show in Milwaukee with your host, Joey Baird, who grew up in the country but now lives closer to the city, and Holly Baird, who has always been a city girl. Combined, they have over 25 years of gardening experience who believe in simple gardening practices. A gardener for all gardeners, founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, where they created over 800 how-to garden videos to teach others how to grow more of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they discuss vegetable gardening and more. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether on those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the simple radio app, the radio tab on the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website, or anywhere in between, we are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination now, containing almost 1,100 garden videos, long, short format uh, for your educational entertainment purposes, as well as in-studio video, short and long, uh, full, full show, as well as segments of this program underneath the radio tab and the highlight tab on the main page of the website. Uh, we are here each and every week. We've got uh, two more weeks left in season one. Uh, and we're here because of great companies you you will hear throughout the hour, just like... Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. Find out more at nesala.com. Uh, you can contact us in a variety of different ways. If you have a question, you want to contact us uh, right now during the show, you can do that on the IV Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline. The ivyorganics.com hotline, 3 one plant guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, you go to ivyorganics.com. You can call on any time during the show, 2414-444-444. 5250. And uh, you can email us at twvgradio at gmail.com, twvgshow at gmail.com, or you can tweet us using hashtag twvg. Kind of a theme there. Uh, we've got, uh, we talked about it last week. We want to do re-mention it because it still is going on. Uh, another great sponsor, the official garden center, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show Bluemels, is being nominated for the A-list Best Garden Center and Best Landscaping categories uh, here in Milwaukee, and they need your help in order to achieve that accomplishment. Right, so it's pretty simple. You just go to the Milwaukee A-list. You can just Google that, and then... Or, or Bluemels.com. Bluemels.com. Go to the bottom has, of the page. Has it there as well, and you can cast your vote. Um, it's pretty simple. You just have to register. You're not going to get spammed or anything like that. Just make sure that you are a real person. Right, just to make sure you they are a real make person. They make sure that they're not getting spammed. A spam. Essentially, yeah. 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 Um, and then you can vote for them. And uh, they have been uh, voted Best Garden Center first place uh, in 2013, 14, and 16 on the Milwaukee A-List. And we hope with your help they can get it for 2017 as well. Well, we've got a lot to cover here. We've got uh, right now is the pear and apple season whether you're picking them or buying them or you have a tree we have a, a pear tree in the front yard uh it's not as uh pr predominant this year as it was prolific prolific this year as it was last year because there's of the, plenty of pears on there yeah but then not as many as there was uh last year so uh what do you do with all of these pears and apples that you get well, we've got 11 things in which you can do some are a little little simple similar simple and some are a little more uh, difficult to uh, accomplish, but it gives you a very good idea with uh, what you can do with this. Right. So one thing that's pretty obvious is that you can can them or you can make things like apple or pear butter. So you can can them into quarters or halves or whatever you choose, and then you have the canned pears. You must peel them first. Right, you must peel them first. Or you can make 
uh, pear, ap- pear applesauce, which is pretty easy to make. You, If you are making pear applesauce, you don't have to peel them. You just have to get them into a... Um, a pulp, essentially. Whether you f- whether through a food processor or a food mill to break that the, the fibers down into that sauce consistency. Uh, now, bo- with both or with all of those, you do not need a pressure canner. You can do this with a water bath canner. So it's not an, an, an essential piece of equipment that you have to have. Uh, water bath is fine for and safe for all of these. Right. So you can definitely do that. Um, you can make a pie, so that's obviously a, a pretty good... Now, you can make the pie, and then you can also freeze that pie in its entirety, and then pull it out. It's not as great as, like, it was made this afternoon, right. but it's homemade pie, and you warm it up, and essentially, it's, it's just as good. We've done it. Works works well. Now, you have to peel for the pie or not? No, you it, don't have to. You might want to, but you don't... It's not necessary. It's no. not going to destroy the pie if you don't peel. Right. Okay. If you're not feeling it, not feeling the, the peeling, you can just... Uh, if you got kids that need to uh, be punished for some reason, that might be <laughs> something you want them to do. And you can bake other things with pears and apples. Um, right. There's oh, yeah. a lot so of different right. recipes online, apple pie or apple cakes, pear cakes, whatever. So definitely, um, if, you're, if you're like, I don't really like pie that much, there's a lot of different things you can make. We can also make our own pear pie filling. Now, for people who have no idea what that means... Holly, can you explain briefly what a pear pie filling is? Right. So I'm sure you've seen the pie filling in the cans at the store. And basically you just open up that can, pour it into a pie shell, put your top, you know, your top or whatever you want on top. And then you have a pie and that's the same thing that you're making in your own home. And you do it, you just jar it up. And then when you want a pie, you get your pie crust and open up your jar and pour it in and you're good to go so basically it's it does take a little bit of extra work because you do have to get what's called clear gel which is what's going to make that that thickness of the pie and you want to get the right kind right and you want to get the cook type and you can only buy it online but once you have that pie filling made it's it's really good right and uh you know, and that uh, you can pear pie filling apple pie filling strawberry pie filling cherry pie filling blue it's not just these two there's a number of way a number of different pear uh, uh, pie filling recipes in which you can can at home so you're ready to go so. right and there's even there's like you know cinnamon ones there's different combinations and people um think they're great so i mean we do it all the time right now pear chutney apple chutney i didn't know what this was until we made it so what i'm sure if i don't know there's some listeners who are not familiar well what is a chutney chutney is also like a compote it's basically like a cooked fruit almost like a salsa but not a salsa because it's more sweet is it a topping or side it's like a a topping okay so if you're making like a, a pork or like a ham steak or something it's a really great topping for that because the sweetness of that pear chutney or the apple chutney is a, a good combination Balances. with that salty. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, we can juice them. Uh, you can. Uh, we juice them. We have a juicer, and we do do a process of filtration of it to get the sediment out, so it's pure pear juice. There's a process. There's some time that's spent on that. There's a lot of mess that go along with that, at least in our ex- uh, experience. Mm-hmm. But it's worth it. I think one year we did like six gallons of pear juice. And the nice thing about the pear juice is that if you are can if you are canning any type of fruit. Or even some jams will call for the use of adding a pear or apple juice. So if you have that pear or apple juice, you can use that then in canning. So if you're canning the whole fruit or something and you need that that sugar, that liquid sugar to can it in, you can use juice instead. And instead of having to buy a processed juice at the store. I mean, this is a process because it's going through a heat treatment in the canner. Yeah, Yeah, but but you know what's in it. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Okay. uh, we can make a pear honey. Yeah, pear honey. Okay. And we I, did this once. Yeah, we did it once, and it was fine. Yeah, it, it's called pear honey, and, and the reason why, you're taking the skins of the pear and cooking it down and adding a tremendous amount of sugar. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it's almost like 50% sugar versus 50% liquid, and it, <clears throat> it it's similar to... It hun- tastes like regular honey. Right, but there's a lot of, lot of sugar in it. And it's uh, it's a bit of work, too. Yeah. But it is an option. So you can use the whole, you know, pear. You can use the, the, the flesh or the meat for the pear pie. You can use the skin for the pear honey. You can use the scraps for pear, uh, for, for fruit scrap vinegar, like we talked about last week on the program. So you're throwing nothing away. Um, now, jams, jellies, we're all familiar with that. Right. So you can make apple jam, apple jelly, pear jam, pear jelly. I made is there this. A, what's the difference? Can, do you know the difference between a jam and a jelly? Sure. So jam is going to have the actual 
pieces of the fruit in it. Okay. And jelly is more of like a like a gel. It's 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 the juice base of the product. Right. Okay. And I we have a, a recipe on so if you have pear apple juice, we have a recipe on the website called fruit juice jelly. Makes a really good jelly. Underneath the rate uh, the mm-hmm. recipe tab on And the any right. fruit yeah. juice works really, but if you have you know, you decide to juice your apples or pears, that's an option. And then I also have another recipe called apple lemon honey jam and you could switch out pears for that too and that's one of the ones i awards i won at the state fair it's on the recipe tab on the right hand side of the main page um sure probably okay. or just search for it you in the just search, search. Bar. yeah mm-hmm. so another way we can just freeze them that's an option uh if you have a lot of pears or apples you can freeze them uh can we just put the whole fruit in the freezer if you want Mushy fruit, yeah. Okay. So you, What's the best way to go about doing this? You're going to want to blanch them. Okay, blanching, we've talked about this, is, is simply putting them in a boiling water pot yeah, for a period water. of time based on the item, mm-hmm. re- uh, removing it, putting it in ice water, stop the cooking, and that uh, changes the molecular structure of the fruit or vegetable to allow it to preserve better in the freezer. Definitely. Yep. Okay. That's right. what exactly what happens. It also prevents the browning, too. Okay. Take t- that oxidation that we're familiar with when we leave a item out t- too long. Uh, pear butter, apple butter, we've talked about that, too. What What's the difference there? Uh, is one better than the other, or is it a per- personal f- preference? Between pear and apple butter? Yeah. They taste the same to me. Okay. What, what is but the... But what is, what's nice about it what, is... What it is a butter? Uh, it, what, uh, that's what I'm asking. What is a butter versus a jam and a jelly? What's Okay, the, so... Jam and jelly is, um, I think, it, I think. well, for one, it has more sugar in it, okay. usually. Um, this is where you cook down the, essentially, to cook down, like, applesauce or pear sauce. And then to all the, thicker all those, consistency. All those sugars kind of condensed down that's already in it. The apple, the pear butter that I make, I don't add any sugar to it. I just add some cinnamon. And since it's cooking down, all that sugar becomes condensed, the natural sugar in the fruits. Um, so it's it has a nice sweetness now to you, it. Now, you, we, we came up with a very interesting and, and worthy tip to pass along. When you're cooking that process down, you can do it on the stove like Grandma did and spend hours and hours and hours of cooking that down to a consistency that's thick enough of, of your personal preference and then jar it up or can it up. You can also do it, what we've done, is put it in slow cookers. Yes, so if you put it in the slow cooker, you want to take the lid and vent it somehow. So you either, like, offset the lid or take some pieces of tin foil and, like, elevate the lid a little bit. Because what what happens in the slow cooker is because that lid is on there, it keeps recycling the moisture that's inside that slow cooker. Which is what the cooker is supposed to do. Which is what it's supposed to do. But when you're making the apple butter, you want that moisture to release. Now, why the slow cooker versus the pot on the stove? Well, for one, you have less chance of it burning. Um, Because it's a slow heat. It's a slow heat, yeah. Um, Two, it makes your house smell amazing, so that's always nice, too. And three, you don't have to babysit it. You can just set it. You don't have to stir it it every five minutes and keep it from rock uh, you know burning up on the bottom of the exactly. pan so and this can do over uh, a couple you know an afternoon process i think we've done it for like 24 hours okay oh that's right yeah uh, but again it's there's no right or wrong thickness it's what you prefer it to be so in, or, or is there a guideline that we need it's to, follow? to what you okay. prefer and when you feel the thickness is right so with that in mind that if you are choosing to do the slow cooker method depending on how much water content you're pears or apples have you may want to set this up and keep in mind it's going to be a 24-hour process where it's not going to happen if you cook it on the stove it might cook faster but there's a bigger chance that you're going to have burnt whatever but don't think you're going to do this on sunny night and then at you know five five o'clock and then all of a sudden it's going to be ready at midnight because it's probably not what is what's going to happen but but it is a great process to use that slow cooker oh for sure and, and i think we've had two going at one time at, you know when we did ours so apples, pears, uh, that's the time now we're getting them. You can just, and, and, and if you want to keep them just, you know, to eat, you could keep them in a, well, no, most people don't have root cellars anymore, but a, a basement or a cool temperature. Do you really want to put them in the fridge to try to keep the longevity or you just want to kind of keep them in a cool place for a couple of you weeks? You can keep at, them in the fridge okay, or we, you can keep them in a cool place. Right, but, but the longevity is shorter than, you know, not as long as we would like it to be. And that's why we look at the preserving methods in which uh, we just went over. So with that being said, Winter is coming. We can certainly grow things indoors over the winter, and we're going to go over about five things that you can do fairly easy indoors come this winter right after this. Tweet 
Joey and Holly using hashtag TWVG. The international food selection at Woodman's is more than just salsa and soy sauce. We stock a huge selection of foods and ingredients from all over the world. Whether it's Asian, Latin American, European, or Middle Eastern, Woodman's has it. Plus, each store has its own unique selection. With Woodman's, you don't need to visit multiple stores to get what you need. We have everything you need under one roof and at a great price. Hot Shed Mill, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour, and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family-owned company, continual standards that are non-GMO, organic at the highest safety levels. Offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed, and more. Even kosher and gluten-free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information and recipes, visit HotShedMill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants, to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, retail manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, Come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Joey and Kelly Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show, 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday morning. Uh, and uh, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for 1,100 plus garden video, short and long format, to help you and entertain you. And uh, there are a lot of other navigational opportunities there on the website. Well, tree-ripe.com, uh, the peach season is about over. but right, we got so if you, yeah, if you like produce delivered right to your neighborhood you should check out tree ripe citrus company you can find out where where to pick up that top quality produce from tree-ripe.com as joey had mentioned the peaches and blueberries are done Wrap at this it, point wrapping up yeah. yeah um however in january ish they're hoping to have they have citrus so that includes typically navel oranges uh honey bells which is a, a really delicious juicy orange and then um temple oranges and grapefruit so because of the hurricanes they're not 100 percent sure how much they'll have but they will have but they will have something yeah. so that's something to look for in january so uh after christmas you might, might want to start looking for it and it's definitely worth it so you want to go to tree-ripe.com they have locations all over including iowa upper and lower michigan minnesota illinois and right here in wisconsin and uh, you can check them out, and uh, we appreciate them supporting the program. Well, when uh, winter hits, most of us, uh, when, and some of us are done gardening already, our garden, uh, based on which one, is kind of not that great. We've talked about the reasons why. Uh, and last year at this time, we were harvesting all the way up to the, fir- uh, the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, we had that first frost in our area, in our garden, and on uh, November the 18th. And we've had frost middle of October, too. So... Uh, with the winter coming, uh, you may be done growing outdoors, but you want to grow something indoors on a very small scale, and you can certainly do that. Yeah, uh, right. So somebody had actually asked me if we were currently growing indoors, and I said, well, we focus on outside. During until we can't go until anymore. Until we can't yeah. go anymore. But uh, there's a lot of things that you can grow, and some people think you need a lot of fancy equipment, and that's not necessarily true. And I think the biggest one to touch on that we grow year-round all the time is we have herbs. Well, let's talk about the equipment real quick. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about the herbs in a moment. Uh, you can use natural light through the window. Uh, preferably south-facing window is the, the best choice because that's going to give you the most ambient light. That's where we hang our herb baskets at in the kitchen. Uh, if you choose to grow other things like we'll talk about here or you don't have that uh, abundance of south southern light, you can use grow lights. Now, 
we choose to use a grow light from Happy Leaf LED. It is a grow light that, ha that is a professional grade grow light with a home gardener's affordability. Uh, they've got now four or five different sizes now from four inch to 33 inch, I believe it is. Uh, and it, it's the LEDs. And the nice thing about the LEDs is the traditional tube lights that we're all familiar with over like after the first year and the second year, the intensity of that bulb decreases dramatically. And at the end of the bulbs, you will begin to see black portions form. And that's an indication that it's losing its goodness and you're going to have to replace it. LEDs do not have that. LEDs will last uh, with the Happy Leaf LED up to a minimum of 50,000 hours on. Now, 50,000 hours for those of you who are interested in knowing how long that is, that's 5.7 years of continuous use. And that's not even a guarantee that they're going to go out at that point. That's just the minimum uh, that they believe that they'll they'll last. So um, it's very easy to do, very easy to use. We hang it underneath one of our, uh, one of the tables in a side room and grow underneath there. It's got a great span of light, three times the intensity of what a tube light is. So with the uh, if you're going to do ambient light, you can certainly do that with some of these vegetables. And you don't you don't even necessarily need that. It is a nice tool to have, but we grew a lot. We've grown a lot with just the regular s daylight. Correct uh, herbs. Uh, you can do basil. We've, we've got basil growing. We've got rosemary growing. We've got uh, a lemon balm or lemon. We've grown lemon balm and lemon basil. And there's like 14 lemongrass. Lemongrass. Mm -hmm. There's several. Uh, I think there's a dozen plus different varieties of basil in which you can grow uh, inside, and it does very well. It, ba herbs are a very low light tolerant plant, which means three to four hours of light. It, it, they'll, they'll, they love full sun, but they will tolerate that three to four or five hours of light not direct light but light so yeah and there's that saying that if you grow up for the fruit or the root you need full sun but if you grow up for the green you can get away with partial sun and that definitely applies here in your home over winter right now with these the next couple of uh, items here that grow light greatly enhances the uh, plant success here uh, with it and that being green beans and kale green beans just the regular pod beans take 40 60 days. Now, you're going to grow all of these. You can do this in a couple of different mediums to grow, and you can do a, uh, a hydroponic method, uh, uh, a passive hydroponic method, which means you simply use n stagnant water with nutrients in it. You're, you're not pumping water through a system. Uh, mason jar, these things sit in what is called a net cup and uh, in clay balls, and they root into the water. So that's a, that's a way that you can grow all of these without much trouble at all. You can also use soil or soilless mix is best. Uh, if, if, um, your gar if, if you still can find soilless mix at the garden center because that doesn't contain, uh, that has a less opportunity of containing bugs you're bringing in. If you're going to use pure compost or pure potting soil, there's an opportunity that there's going to be bugs, soil gnats, that type of thing, which it, it's, it's here or there. Uh, you can also use cocoa core and vermiculite mix right that, but if, a you, roots, if you roots. do this any of those you right. need to add the nutrients true true so but i wanted to give the the options there so okay with with green beans and kale you can grow that uh the kale will do somewhat decent off a window mm -hmm. the green beans really need more of that intense light that the grow light provides um and we've grown excess green beans successfully indoors without any problem right we now you're not going to grow enough to have like canning capabilities no but it's nice to just have some and right. it's kind of fun too you're growing something over winter and it's kind of brightens your day sometimes so that's kind of nice about it makes you feel a little warm and sunny on the right. inside because when it you know it's cold outside um but we grew tomatoes this past or yeah, past, past couple yep. years actually and uh, on christmas day we had some decent sized tomatoes now you can grow tomatoes without using a grow light by using the ambient light out the window the only disadvantage to that is one the plant is going to grow slower and two because of that lack of light ambient light coming in at the intensity that it would outdoors when your fruit ripens, the skin is going to be much thicker than it would if it had the correct amount of light. It just that's the way the plant grows. It thickens the skin because it's slower to ripen. So uh, that's the only disadvantage. Now, you can do cucumbers if you have like a grow tent or something like that. Uh, any vine crop is going to take much, much more space than 
it's worth essentially unless you've already invested in that. And we grew sun uh, sunflowers, couple sunflowers, sunflowers dwarf, dwarf sunflowers. Yeah, yeah dwarf sunflowers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dwarf sunflowers, not like six foot tall sunflowers. But yeah, we grew some dwarf sunflowers. Uh, worked very well. Now, if you're going to grow, you can grow root crops. But again, you want to go in that vermic. You want to do in a soilless or uh, soil or a, a cocoa core base, so the the root develops correctly. Otherwise, if you try to grow it in a passive hydroponic method, the 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 root is not going to the carrots or the 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 potatoes or the you know radishes are not going to develop correctly. We tried to do radishes in a hydroponic system last year, and they just did not develop because of the there wasn't no dense. Uh, you grow hydroponically. We did in what is called clay pebbles or clay balls, and they're like little marbles of clay that absorbs moisture and then feeds the roots, which there wasn't enough density around the root of those crops in order to correctly develop, and we had radishes that were green had the greens but no a bulb on them whatsoever so we had a lot of uh, success growing green beans out of that yeah green beans worked Mm -hmm. very well lettuce worked very well spinach worked pretty good on that cilantro worked incredibly well and that's another herb that you can grow is is cilantro uh indoors in any of these methods and you can go to our website and find a lot of these methods in which we've practiced indoors and if you have limited space year round, say maybe you don't have a yard or a patio or something like that, you can you can grow this year round too. Right. But right. it's just something that if you if you are looking to maybe grow a few things inside during the winter, definitely some good options here. And and there, this is just some of the varieties of things. Now, uh, word to the wise: uh, onions don't try to grow them indoors because those are unless you can monitor. Uh, the daylight, because they're daylight sensitive, and it's, uh, throughout the growing, we're in a long day uh, area here in Wisconsin. So as the days get longer, at a certain point, the, the plant outdoors in your garden stops developing top growth and focuses on bulb growth. Growth. When you try to grow them indoors, unless you have that down pretty close every day adjusting the light, you're not going to get bulbs of onions. Now, you'll get greens, but you're not going to get, so don't mess with that. Leeks are pretty, uh, leeks are not like that. Leeks will grow uh, fine if all conditions are correct. And some of these are day-length sensitive crops indoors, and some of them are neutral sensitive uh, plants indoors. So you want to be neutral, you want to get the neutral type of uh, plant. You just, I mean, you just have to figure it out, uh, do some research um, on what you're going to grow indoors. So with that, uh, next year, your, gar- your yard is going to need maintenance, and you can certainly uh, start figuring out how you can make that happen and, and get good quality equipment in order to make your yard look beautiful again. Do you hear that? That's your neighbor shaking in the grass-stained shoes because Aaron's is about to help you step up your grass-cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox, so the Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy studio deal con- steel construction, smarter, smoother controls, professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is a sweet taste of victory. Aaron's, it comes down to this. Visit Aaron's.com to find your local dealer for lawn and soon snow removal equipment. Yes, uh, we're going to have snow eventually here, uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, When we come back, the founder and CEO of a phenomenal organization, ampleharvest.org, Gary Oppenheimer, will be here, and we're going to talk about food waste in America and how we can make our little world a little bit better by preventing that right after this. a gardening question email joey and holly at twvg radio at gmail.com oh yeah what you say you say nasala kombucha it'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step nasala kombucha <laughs> yeah do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at greenstockgarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. Greenstockgarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. 
proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit GreenStockGarden.com. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side and greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice, a health food store with hundreds of products, vitamins, supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available. Open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from plantsuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. Plantsuccess.com carries powder, granule, and tablet forms of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit plantsuccess.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show, 860 AM, WNOV, and W293CX106.5. Thanks so much for spending a little time with us on this Saturday morning. And uh, the, you can also spend a little bit of time at the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. We talked about it earlier in the program, uh, trying to get not, uh, trying to get uh, trying to win best garden center as well as best landscaping categories. Uh, you can go to bluemills.com to at the bottom. Uh, just scroll to the bottom of the page and find that voting tab there. But uh, well, yeah, you can go there while you, you may not be thinking of gardening, but they have pumpkins, they have gourds, they have everything you need to make your home nice. They have mums, they have kales. Straw bales. Straw bales make your home ready for uh, fall. Um, so definitely that's a lot of fun. They have a coffee shop. Um, they have a if, if enclosed it, playground. Enclosed playground, maybe not for today, but on a nice. Maybe it, maybe <laughs> for today. <laughs> for today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dress your kids right, I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, so you can go to forty nine thirty West Loomis Road in Greenfield. Go to bluemills dot com or call four one four two eight two forty two twenty. Uh, Holly, let's go to the Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard Hotline and bring in our next guest. This week's guest is Gary Oppenheimer from AmpleHarvest.org. He's the founder and CEO. We're going to learn all about this unique and important organization. Welcome to the program, Gary. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day uh, to join us. I know we talked to, to Jamie, and she's like your right-hand person that makes this uh, all work out. And uh, we thank you for taking time to, to inform not only Holly and myself, but all of our listeners about the organization and how important it is for all of us. Well, I thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be speaking to everybody in Wisconsin, and I've never spoken there yet, so this is a great opportunity. AmpleHarvest.org is a program founded in 2009 with the singular mission of both educating and enabling America's home and community gardeners to be able to finally donate their excess garden produce to a nearby food pantry. Uh, we have 42 million people in the country who grow food. That's a lot of food. And that most of them grow too much food. And meanwhile, we've got pantries and food banks down the street that uh, have no fresh food. So the idea was to connect the two so that for the rest of the gardener's life, whenever she or he grew too much food, that food would be donated so that hungry people in the community could benefit. Well, in 2009, what was the aha moment or what did you see that you said, I've got to do something and, and here's what I'm going to do? The aha moment, it's an interesting question. Um, I had my own garden, which was overly prolific. I managed to find a place in my town, I'm from northern New Jersey, that I could donate the food to, but it took some work. But I was asked to take over the directorship of a local community garden, and the people there complained to me also that they had too much food. They were frustrated at the end of a season, seeing people bored, overwhelmed, or on vacation, food going basically left to rot in the garden while they were gone. And my comment was, if we're going to have an ample harvest, the least we can do is get the people who really need it. They loved the idea. They uh, set out to put a program together. I went on Google to find all the food pantries in my town, and Google said the nearest one was in a town 25 miles away, which I knew was wrong. The aha moment was in March of 2009 when I realized if 
I, and I'm an internet pioneer, so if I, as an internet pioneer, had trouble finding food pantries in my community, so would everybody else. And if I and the community garden is growing too much food, so is everybody else. And this seemed like a, a necessary and great thing for the country in terms of um, solving several problems at the same time. One, obviously, is food waste, but the other is hunger, malnutrition, and by extension, also helping the environment. And it all came together in uh, May of 2009 when I launched ampleharvest.org. Within 150 days, which just happened to be World Food Day, 1,000 food pantries had already signed up. The pantry's saying, we want the food, we'd love to get it. And uh, today we're past 8,100 pantries, which is about one out of every four in America. Now that's the the pantries are signing up. That you're not going after them and going, hey, please sign up. They're voluntarily signing up because they want this to be brought into their facilities. Well, we're going after them to make them aware, but they have to sign okay. up. And this is actually something that the people in uh, your listeners can do, whatever community they're in. Uh, they should visit ampleharvest.org, do the find a pantry function, put in their own zip code, and if they know of a pantry in their community that they don't see in our list. They should go to that food pantry and say, hey, listen, there's a great program. You should sign up for it. And they should tell them four things. Number one, it's free. Number two, the pantry does not need refrigeration. Number three, it does need storage. And number four, it's free. Say the free part twice. That's really, really important. Once the pantry is signed up and once we have vetted them to make sure they meet our criteria, which is simple that they're a nonprofit and they give food away for free, uh, we activate them and then... Whenever a gardener in that area says, oh my, too many zucchini or tomato or what have you, they come to ampleharvest.org and that pantry is among the others that show up. They can then, now they now know that whether it's the YMCA or, or the St. Mary's Church has a food pantry, and they know the day of the week and the hours when they want the donation. They can take the food there. By the way, that latter part, the day, the week, and hours is critical because if the food is, if some, for example, pantry says we want the food, please, on Saturday mornings from 9 to noon, because our clients are coming in Saturday from noon to 3, the gardener knows when to harvest, Saturday morning, Friday night, they take the food in Saturday morning, it's laid out, the clients, the hungry families pick it up on, on Saturday afternoon, it's on a dinner table Saturday night. It is fresher than you and I could buy in the best supermarket, and um, it eliminates the storage and refrigeration need. And once the gardener knows that they can donate the food to this food pantry, when and where, they actually don't need us anymore. They'll donate there for the rest of their gardening life and tell their immediate friends and family uh, who are gardeners that this particular place would love to get your food. Fantastic. Now, we talked about food waste on the show here a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. How much food does America really waste? On the whole, if you look at the big picture of the United States as a whole, we waste enough food to every single day fill the Rose Bowl. It's a staggering amount of food. That statistic does not include one number, and that is the food waste in America's home and community gardens. We did a two-year study with 2,500 gardeners, and what we learned was that the excess food grown just in gardens, not farms, in the same gardens, exceeds 11 billion pounds. It's enough to feed 28 million people. You could see the study, you could see the results. There's actually a university white paper written on it. If you go to ampleharvest.org slash study, it is a huge amount of food, but it's also a huge opportunity for the country. Now, you, you touched on this slightly a few moments ago, but why do people who have gardens waste food, and why haven't they been donating to food pantries for years, why is this just a new concept now to home gardeners? Uh, they, they are growing too much food because we all do that. You know, I come out of March and April. I've had a, I'm have fidgety from the winter, and I can't wait to get out, and I just plant too many seeds. And to be blunt, you know, sometimes animals or fungi get your crop, and so you overplant just to make sure that you're going to get what you really want. The reason they haven't donated has been because we have all grown up with the misinformation. Um, I forget the misinformation. We've all grown up with the mantra from food drives of jars, cans, boxes, no fresh food. 
we've all been inculcated with the idea that we're not allowed to donate fresh food. We can only donate store-bought food. So for most gardeners, they haven't even thought about donating stuff because every food drive they've ever been at, they've been told, we're not going to take your fresh food. The reason for that was how the American food bank system works. And I don't want to go into details in a short time, but the bottom line is when you donate food at a food drive, it'll ultimately get to a food pantry. It could be days or weeks later. Now, that's fine for store-bought food. It's not going to work for fresh food. The idea behind Ample Harvest Order was to shortcut that entire process. So as I said earlier, the food would go from my garden to somebody's dinner table on a same-day basis. This is really a peer-to-peer -peer solution um, that is, while it's a local program, we do it on a national scale. And, and we've got listeners not only in Milwaukee, but replay on, in, in all 50 states and around, and, and around the world, essentially. But, um, but now, for people who are listening who don't have an overabundance of food, how do they find these food pant pantries with the fresh produce? Uh, anybody can go to ampleharvest.org. If you're asking about somebody who actually is having trouble putting food on the table, they can visit ampleharvest.org and also use the find pantry function, and they will contact the pantries that come up and say, can I come in? I should say that if anybody's having outright difficulty in, to begin with feeding their family, they should either contact whyhunger.org or 211, the National Hunger Hotline, for assistance on those things. I mean, that should be your primary go-to point for any challenge in your life, but you can certainly come to a food pantry on ampleharvest.org. Since the food donated is excess food from gardens, uh, somebody should not go to ampleharvest.org in February if they're in the north and expect to find locally grown garden food there. It won't happen. The food comes in waves, particularly when people have uh, are in their harvest, spring or autumn harvest or whatever. That's when the bulk of that food comes in. The crux of what we're trying to solve is ending the waste of food. The benefit is to millions of families across the country who um, are needed. Let me give you one other sidebar note. We have a program uh, every year called Centerpieces for Pantries. We're about to announce it, in which we encourage people for their holiday events, uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas dinners, weddings, bar mitzvahs, what have you, to not put floral arrangements on the table. FTD hates us for this. Put out arrangements of whole fruits and vegetables, whether you bought them or grew them is irrelevant. Make that your centerpiece, and you can donate that to a food pantry the next day. So that even in the cold weather, gardeners or otherwise, people can donate fresh food to a food pantry that otherwise would never have it. Absolutely. Now, you, it doesn't take many people to turn on the news and see there's a lot of divisions in this country, but what you've created or uh, started to develop is what's called the Interfaith Program. Now, can you explain what that is and how, uh, no matter what side of the, the aisle you're on, food brings us all together and explain the importance of this Interfaith Program? Absolutely. The program, the website's foodwasteweekend.org. This was a program we piloted in 2016. We started really for, for real this year. The idea was that for all of the people, and there are many of us working in the food waste realm, uh, trying to get America not to waste food, the one group I always noticed that was missing was the faith community. And it's important because 70% of pantries are in a house of worship. Food Waste Weekend is an opportunity that we created so that clergy, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and Unitarian, could all do faith-specific sermons on the topic of food waste all in the same weekend. We, in effect, had a single sermon, faithy sounding, but secular sermon written about food waste. And then a partner organization translated it into New Testament, Old Testament, Koran, etc. So for each faith community, the idea was for the clergy, the rabbis, the priests, the imams, etc., to go to the site, find the sermon that's appropriate for their faith, and then on that particular weekend or any other weekend, when they give the sermon, they could talk about food waste, and more particularly, they could start talking to their congregants not about let's feed the hungry, but about let's end hunger. It changes the entire dynamic. We even had a game show there for the religious school and eight calls to action that the clergy person can give to the congregants to tell them what to do. So the cool thing is that during Food Waste Weekend or any weekend since then, 
an imam on a, in a mosque on a Friday, a rabbi in a synagogue on a Sunday, or a minister and priest on a Saturday, or a minister and priest on a Sunday, would be speaking on the same theme to their congregations about ending food waste in America. Although it too, uh, Food Waste Weekend actually applies on a global scale. Well, Gary, we greatly appreciate you taking time sharing the information about ampleharvest.org, not only with Holly, myself, but all of our listeners live and, and, and in the future here on replay on podcasts and in-studio video. It's my pleasure. And if anybody wants to support our work, ampleharvest.org slash donate. It would be very helpful and appreciated. But thank you. It was lovely talking to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Gary. And when we come back, your garden questions and our garden answers right after this. A gardening question, you can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. The River West Co-op Grocery and Cafe is proud to support the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and a lot of other Wisconsin growers as well. The Co-op offers a wide range of local and organic produce in their store and on their cafe menu. From apples to yogurt and everything in between. Open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekdays, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekends at the corner of Clark and Frackney in Milwaukee's River West neighborhood. See what is in store and check out the Co-op Cafe's delicious vegetarian menu at riverwestcoop.org. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. With over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom and organic, flower, vegetable and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools and special blend fertilizer. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more visit bobex.com b-o-b-b-e-x dot c-o-m i want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs i want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community all i want is a garden center that truly values their customers it seems like everyone is selling plants these days but i'm having a hard time finding quality i take pride in my garden so i want my garden center to take pride in their products where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season blue mel's garden center we are your answer. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. And you're absolutely right about the tomatoes. Next to a very good woman, tomatoes come in a close second. With your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, your destination for all things gardening. We're going to jump right into the IVOrganics.com hotline. We have a caller, and uh, you have a question? Yes. Go right ahead. Uh, I was looking for the LED grow lights, and I went to Menards, and they said they never carried anything like that. Okay. Okay, so you would have to go online and go to Happy Leaf, H-A-P-P-Y-L-E-A-F dot com. And that's where you're going to find them. I don't think you can find them at regular stores. You can also go to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com. On the right-hand side main page, you'll see that it says Happy Leaf LED, and you can link to their website uh, from there. What do you do if you don't have a website? Okay. Or a... You... <laughs> I guess you'd probably have to uh, find a friend or family member that would be willing to help you purchase it. I guess that's what I would do. Um, oh. But I don't really know where you could... You, there's not really a place for you to purchase them. Other, uh, you could, if you wanted to wait until February and then go to the Garden Expo in Madison, um, that they, they have them for sale there. But unfortunately, there's it's uh, definitely more of an internet-based business. Okay. Okay. Because I've been looking around town here, and I well, just... You could go to the library and use the computer there. Yeah, I'll try that. 
Okay. Thank you very much for your call and your question and listening to the show, sir. Okay. Thank you. And if you've got a question, you can call into the Ivy Organics 3 one Plant Guard Hotline, Holly. Ivy Organic 3 one Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivyorganics.com. You can call in right now to 414-444-5250, and I think we have a caller on the line. Yep. Uh, caller, you're on the air. You have a question, comment? Good afternoon, or good morning, should I say. I just want to make a comment regarding the previous caller's question regarding the LED lighting. Yes. Um, they're actually sold at Milligers, so if he can get to Milligers, he can easily, you know, acquire one. Okay. At Milligers, that's in Racine, right? Yes. Okay. Um, Racine or start of it. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thank you for the information. Thank you for listening, and thank you for calling in. Uh, we had a number of questions come in uh, this past week on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, all of that stuff, and um, we can. Uh, and we go got another caller. We'll go to the IVOrganics.com hotline. Caller, you're on the air. Yes. Good morning. Uh, I'm calling. I would like to know what I could use in my garden for, like snails or slugs or whatever you call them. Uh, they get on the cabbage real bad and also the tomatoes. I'm going to hang up and listen for your suggestion. I have tried soap suds and all that, and it doesn't work. Okay. So I'm going to hang up and listen for your uh, comment. All right. Thank you very much for the call. So snails and slugs, you can definitely take coffee grounds and put them around your garden. They don't like that because it hurts their that, underside. That or sand. It's not or 100% sand. effective, but it does reduce the amount of slugs and snails now for sl sl for slugs also a beer based uh, mixture in a cup just, works just beer, yeah, in beer. A cup. so yeah. you bury the cup so that it's ground level you pour some beer in there and those slugs will fall right into it they they do enjoy i guess the beer or whatever it is maybe the yeast in it but they do fall right into it um if you have little uh on, the on that, cabbage on, loopers on, yeah, on that note on the on the slugs you want to do that away from the plant so they're not all coming towards that plant and going to the beer, you want to kind of set that cup away. The, the the hop smell will attract them and pull them away from the plants. Also, cleaning the debris up around the base of the plant so they don't have anywhere to kind of hide under, uh, and, and they're more exposed. That also is a, a helping helping uh, cause to the getting rid and of. And sometimes, it. if you have different cabbages or greens, there's a cabbage looper, and it's a tiny little bug. And sometimes that, you, if you take uh, the soapy water spray, but then you add rubbing alcohol to it that helps keep them away as well and then i forgot what else i was going to say um the beer and oh and then bt bt will often get rid of a lot of animals you can buy that at your local garden center it's bt I, it's got a really long scientific name but you can buy that in a powder or liquid form now on all of these when it rains you have to reapply because it will wash the the, the material off um, for you who called for that, um, uh, we will do more research and get you a few more points next week at the beginning of the show so we can make sure that you get the information. That's just off the top of our head. I know there's some research and some sites I can go to to get you some more in-depth, detailed information to help your garden grow better uh, next year and, and maybe prolong it this year. So we will definitely dive in more to that at the beginning of next week's show. So with that being said, we had uh, questions come in this week, and uh, we had a nice comment as well. Uh, one is, um, uh, uh, we did a video a couple of weeks ago. It's on the website. We have a squash that is crossed. Oh, yeah. So we had a, uh, it was it's a, it's a, a winter squash. It's a, a spaghetti squash that's crossed with a pumpkin, so it doesn't create a spaghetti-like texture. It's more of a pumpkin spaghetti squash without the stringy. So Interest. what they want to know is that if it was going to store like a regular spaghetti squash, and yes, it's still a winter squash, which means that it's going to store for a few months as long as you keep it in a cool, like a cooler, dry place out of direct sunlight, it's going to store for a few months. So. And you're going to pr pr process it just like you would a pumpkin. You're going to have to cut it down. You're going to have to uh, cook it. Uh, it's not going to have the stringy consistency like a spaghetti squash has in it. Um, for those, uh, there are some of you who are growing yacons. Uh, we did uh, have those at our garden talks early this spring. So how did they wanted to know how we preserved our yacons 
And we're, will there be a video on that? One thing we do is we keep them in buckets of sand. No, that's the rhizomes. No, that's the rhizomes. Yeah. What do we do with our well, We put them in the a stairway of the attic. Oh, right. Now, what we need to do, which they're not as good this year for whatever reason on our end, I know some people who we've uh, sold them to at our garden talk said they were doing very well for them, which is great, is we should... We, we need to peel the small ones and freeze them. If you go to the uh, Hispanic, is that the correct terminology, area uh, grocery stores, you'll find them in the frozen aisles, peeled and, and I guess, blanched. Um, yeah, so you can treat them like a potato. So yeah. if you wanted to preserve them, you would peel them, you would blanch them, and then you could freeze them. We don't. We haven't found anything about safely canning yacons, so your best bet is to freeze them. Yeah. Um, when it comes to aside from uh, one, uh, is it too late to plant garlic? No, you can still do that now, up to uh, you know a couple of weeks before your first hard freeze. So you can get garlic still in the ground. Still, still nothing wrong with that. Uh, you don't want to buy store bought sp- store bought garlic. You want to buy a a variety that you know the the where it came from, an heirloom variety preferably, that has a name, not some g- generic stuff you bought from the store. Farmers markets may still have it, but where uh, instead of buying it online, what is another place or places that you can get it? Well, you could ask a friend or family member if they have any extra. Um, aside from online, local farmers markets, as you would mentioned, we got ours from Copper Kettle Farm. I'm not sure if they have any. Uh, I went on the yet. website and they still show they had some. Okay. That's over in Colgate. Now, there's right. a little bit of a but drive. They do, they do go to different farmers markets. Okay. And, and so you sell. can reach out to them and find out. Um, but yeah, you don't want to, if you, if you can't find locally, um, you don't want to. Uh, you don't want to just buy it online from a store in Seattle because it's not going to be a regional type of garlic. Uh, we've talked about garlic a lot, but that's an important vegetable or uh, important item to grow in your garden that does take up a lot of space, but it's very, very rewarding, even though it takes about nine months to grow. Um, now we did have a, uh, can I come? Okay, here's one. Uh, we'll get, uh, Blue Mel's had, Blue Mel's commented uh, on a, um, on our Facebook page, which is always nice to see sponsors comments. So, so they said, you guys are the absolute best. If you have the best garden radio show, no doubt you would be the winners. Thanks, Joe and Holly, for making this another great season. Well, we appreciate that. We appreciate those uh, from, kind words. From, from Blue Mel's and, and everybody that works there. Uh, real quickly, before we get out of here, can I compost bones? Um, Okay, so you need a special type of composter. So if you compost bones, you're going to attract things like mice, skunks, uh, possibly not... Wildlife. Yeah, wildlife, basically. Um, Who knows what you could... And if you lived in the right area, you could probably attract bears, too. So, and biting flies will lay their eggs in this type of compost, which leads to worse problems. So what you would want to do is you want to... You have to have a specially designed composter. Basically, it's not worth it. However, if you're like, I don't really feel like tossing these bones, there's a couple things you can do to, um, you know, if you're really trying to focus on less waste, one thing you can do is make, you can make your own bone broth, which is something that I do. It's pretty simple. You take your old bones. I collect them in a freezer bag. I use chicken bones until I have enough to make a, a batch. And then once they're ready, I cook them down with some vegetable scraps, typically onion peels, garlic peels, and then any other vegetables that may be possibly going bad. I cook those down for about at least four hours, if not more. I strain all those stuff off. And then at that point you have you have more of a use for them. Um, you can also make your own bone meal. Um, this is a little bit more work, but you would want to make sure those bones are complete, completely clean. So you, most people just, you know, scrub them, cook them, whatever, yeah. and then they then they bake them, or the, they could bake them to get all that stuff off. Then you dry them out just on a in a well-ventilated area. Usually takes a few days. Then you're going to grind them up with a mortar and a pestle. Yeah. So if you're really committed to not keeping your bones, there's a few different things you can do. Uh, this program is brought to you by the sponsors you've heard throughout the program, just like Nathala Kabucha, the Nath- official Nassala uh, Kabucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nassala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Nassala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. Find out more at nassala.com. Programming note, jo- programming note, join us next week. We're going to talk about six oxygen-producing house plants that you need to at least have one in your home. Uh, they're they're oxygen-making wonderful uh they're called auction bomb plants so that's great as well as putting your garden to bed what you need to know before you walk away from your garden this year and we're going to have guest uh he's an author called his name is michael carolyn and he is a 
author of No One Eats Alone, Food as a Social Enterprise. As there you go. So miss any portion of this program or want to visit it in its entirety, find that under the radio tab on the website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com. You can also find segments of individual interviews and uh, topics under the highlight tab on the right hand side. Until next week for Holly Baird. I'm Joy Baird and we will see you in the garden.